population screening for uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. Now, uh, family history has long been known to be a significant risk factor for breast cancer, and what you can see in this slide is the family pedigree of the wife of Pierre Broca, who you might know as the person who described the language center in the brain. And this is a pedigree that he drew of his wife's family in the 19th century. And uh, people marked in black had cancer, those that are also circled in red had breast cancer. And I think it's very clear to see that over multiple generations, there were multiple women affected at young ages with breast cancer. So they realized something familial was going on. At that point, obviously, it wasn't called genetic. Uh, we've heard a lot about the environment and microbiome in the previous talks. So I want to stress the fact that, the, that familiality doesn't necessarily mean something is genetic because there are also factors of shared environment. However, uh, when we see pedigrees like this, where over four generations there's so many cases of cancer, the environment changes significantly over four generations. So here we can really assume something genetic is going on. Despite this, until the 1970s and 1980s, uh, st uh, when studies by Dr. Mary Claire King, who's my close collaborator, showed that there was actually a genetic locus for hereditary breast cancer, the thought that cancer could be hereditary was thought um, to be kind of crazy. But finally, in the 1990s, two of the major genes for breast cancer and ovarian cancer risk were cloned, and these were BRCA1 in 1994 and BRCA2 in 1995. In Israel, we have a unique situation where it comes to these mutations, because in a, certain, in a subset of Jews, Ashkenazi Jews, these are Jews of European origin, there are three mutations in these genes that are particularly common, two in BRCA1 and one in BRCA2, and overall, one in 40 Ashkenazi Jews carry one of these mutations, both men and women. Other mutations are rare in Ashkenazi Jews, so this means that if we test for the three mutations, the chance that we're missing another mutation in these genes is very small. So we have a very simple test with high sensitivity and high specificity. If we look at what happened to testing for BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations the world over, we've really undergone an evolution. Originally, families tested were the ones like Pierre Broca's wife's family. So we tested in high-risk families, and the aim was to identify women who are at extremely high risk in order to do primary prevention. We then moved on as a field to test patients with specific cancers, particularly breast and ovarian cancer. The idea there is one to prevent the occurrence of a second malignancy. We know that a woman who had breast cancer because of an inherited mutation has a much higher risk of getting a second breast cancer during her lifetime, and perhaps more importantly, she may develop ovarian cancer um, on average about 10 years later. The issue is that whereas breast cancer is easily detected early and is highly treatable, ovarian cancer cannot really be detected early. Most patients are diagnosed at late stages of the disease, stage three or four, and the five-year survival is still very, very um, unfortunate, about only about 50%. So one thing we want to do is prevent a second malignancy. But what really drove the field forward were the therapeutic implications, because we now know that women who have breast cancer as a result of BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations should be treated differently. They are sensitive to different types of chemotherapy. They're more sensitive, for example, to platins. And there's now a whole group of biological drugs, PARP inhibitors, that are specific to women with these mutations. So for patients, once, uh, these, once we understood that the mutations had a therapeutic implication, testing really took off. And if we look at studies that we and others have done, um, and look at the attributable risk of these mutations, in Ashkenazi Jews, we know that 11% of all breast cancer cases and 40% of all ovarian cancer cases are caused by mutations in these genes. I'm going to talk a lot about Ashkenazi Jews because that's the population that I've worked with, simply because that's 50% of the pop Jewish population of Israel, but also because uh, we have three common mutations we were able to start, even 10 years ago and more, very large-scale studies that were not possible at the time with sequencing of entire genes. Right now, sequencing of entire genes is very cheap and can be done on a large scale, but 10 years ago, this was not possible, and the Ashkenazi Jewish population offered an opportunity to do large-scale population type of studies. This is not possible in many other populations, and while the Ashkenazi Jewish situation is a little greater than what it is in other populations, it is not extremely different. In all Caucasians, 7 to 8 percent of all breast cancer cases are caused by these mutations, and about 20 percent of all ovarian cancer uh, cases. 
And what this really means is that if we were able to identify these women, uh, these carriers, before they were affected and somehow prevent their disease, we could have a significant impact on the occurrence of breast and ovarian cancer in general. And there is such an opportunity. And, and, and that is risk reduction, stopping ovarectomy, that is removal of the ovaries and the fallopian tubes, which has been shown to reduce both morbidity and overall total mortality by about 80% in BRC1 and BRC2 carriers. And I want to stress that this is a reduction in all-cause mortality. Uh, if you look at prevention for other types of cancer, let's say colonoscopies for colon cancer, mammographies for breast cancer, there is a reduction in mortality that's disease-specific. So if you care about whether you're going to die of breast cancer or from another disease, then you know, that's, a, that's um, a good test. But there are very few preventive measures that actually decrease all-cause mortality, and risk reduction something gophorectomy in carriers is one of those rare occurrences. You will also notice that I'm not mentioning uh, bilateral prophylactic mastectomy. In Israel, at least, most carriers choose not to have this operation. It's highly effective, but obviously um, it's much more difficult psychologically. So it's important to mention that there is an operation that is acceptable and that significantly decreases mortality. I am a medical geneticist. I see patients uh, every week. And this is a patient from my clinic, a 49-year-old woman. She develops, uh, she, she came diagnosed with stage three ovarian cancer. And all ovarian cancer case, uh, patients in our hospital are tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2 because of the therapeutic implications. And she was found to be a carrier of one of the common BRCA1 mutations. If you look at your head her family, there's really very little or no family history. There's a great uncle on her father's side who had sarcoma at age 80. So this is a woman who, based on her family history, would not have suspected that she was a carrier. Yet here she is at age 49 with a disease that will likely be fatal for her, um, and only now we find out that there was a genetic cause. So that started me thinking about using this for prevention at the population level. Because obviously, if we test women only after the woman becomes affected, that's one woman too late. We should have found this out before she became affected. And the way to solve that is to think about population screening. Now, if you want to think about population screening, it's a completely different paradigm from testing people who are affected or people who have a family history. And so I turned to the age-old principles formulated in 1968 uh, by Wilson and Jungner about how disease screening takes about. And these principles are really universal. They've been used for cholesterol testing, for thalassemia testing, for hypertension, for many uh, diseases. And you can see the criteria here. And the question is, how do BRCA1 and BRCA2 testing fit into these criteria? So I think we can agree that breast and ovarian cancer are important diseases. The late, latent uh, stage in this disease is the asymptomatic carrier. However, the natural history of the disease should be understood. And what I mean here by natural history is if we're going to test carriers in the population, we should be sure that they're indeed at high risk because previously we had really been testing only people with family history or women who already had cancer. So these are cases that already showed us that they are at high risk. At least theoretically, you could think that maybe in the population, some carriers are at low risk. Maybe they have other protective genetic factors or protective environmental factors. So we really need to prove that if we identify carriers at the population level, they're still going to be at high risk. Is there a suitable test in, in our population? Yes, we can test for the three uh, common mutations, which, which is very simple. Would the test be acceptable to the population? Again, that's something that would need to be examined. There is, however, um, a satisfactory treatment, which is risk reduction, self-inglophorectomy. There should be ongoing screening facilities and a green policy on whom to treat, which is to treat carriers. All of this is already in place. And then the last thing we would have to look at would, would be to see if all of this would be cost-effective. So we started out a few years ago by looking at the natural history and asking the question, what happens if we find carriers at the population level? Will they still be at very high risk? Now, how do we find women who are carriers at the population level? And what we did was we tested unaffected men. Um, they didn't, we didn't choose on personal history of cancer. They themselves, I mean, they themselves could not have cancer, but they could or could not have a family history, and they were just healthy men. And once we identified carriers among these healthy men, we then went out to their families, tested the women in the families, found out who was a carrier and who was not, and looked at the actual breast and ovarian cancer risk in these women. 
And what did we find? So we tested over 8,000 men. The carrier frequency was about 140, as we expected. We identified 175 carriers. We then went on into their families, and we asked them about their family histories. We matched them uh, to a set of controls. And you could see that we had information on 97% of carriers and 95% of controls. So we had pretty complete information. What about family history? So if you look at the non-carrier controls, we can see that 80, 89% of them, about 90%, did not have any family history. This means they're representative of a general population, because in general, we would expect about 10% of people to have a family history. So no surprise there. What about the carriers? Well, 15 of them had significant family history, which is not surprising, right? We expect carriers to have a strong family history. And these are people who should probably have had genetic analysis before. But what we did see is that 63% of the carriers did not have significant family history. And this number is actually borne out by many studies across the world in that about 50% of carriers don't have a family history. And I'm going to get back to the question of why don't they? So, I, as I said, once we identified these 175 families through these healthy men, we went out and tested their female relatives. We tested almost 480 female relatives. Very few, 2%, refused to be tested. About half were carriers, half were non-carriers. And um, we could see that 44% of the women had already been affected. So that already gave us an idea that there was a higher risk. And if we did this analysis form formally, you can see the breast cancer risk was 60% lifetime risk in BRCA1 carriers, 40% in BRCA2 carriers. Just to remind you, the uh, risk in the general population for breast cancer is 12%, so this is a significantly higher risk. We had very high risks for ovarian cancer, about 50% by age in the, for both BRCA1 and BRCA2 carriers, and the overall risk is very high to carriers identified in the general population, about 80% to develop either breast or ovarian cancer uh, during their lifetimes. We also saw evidence for environmental effects. So we split the population, into the, the, the women tested into those born before or after 1958, because that was the median year of birth of the women who participated in the study. And you can see, let's say at age 40, that women who were born in earlier years were at lesser risk than women born in later years who were, were at much higher risk. And what this tells us is that all the risk factors that operate on women in the Western world in general uh, earlier age of menstruation, later age of menopause, later age of childbearing, uh, less breastfeeding, all of these also operate on carriers. So the risk in carriers is just getting higher. So like I said, about 60% had no family history. So why is that? They could, they could have not have had family history because the risk was low, but I hope I've convinced you it's not true, the risk is high. So what we're really talking about is that there's a low incidence of cancer observations in about half of carrier families. Now why does that happen? Partly it happens because of lack of information. People don't necessarily know that their relatives have cancer. At least in Israel, I don't know what it's like in Mexico, some people hide the fact that they have cancer. They don't necessarily tell their first cousin, you know, I had ovarian cancer. The other 50% were small families that had multiple males. Males can get some kind of types of cancer, but the risk is much lower, and also what we call Mendelian luck. While in each family, approximately 50% will be carriers, in a specific family, it can be less, or these carriers can be males. Going back to the family I told you about, it turned out that this woman inherited her mutation from her father. Uh, this, this, this man's 93-year-old mother was still alive, so we could test her. She was not a carrier. So this means that this, the mutation was inherited from the paternal grandfather, and you can see that this is a small family with many men uh, who did not have children. So she's really the first female who was actually um, at risk, and she developed ovarian cancer. So going back to our uh, principles of screening, I think we can say that the natural history of the disease is understood, and that we're talking about uh, very high risk, even in the population. So the next thing we started looking at in the last couple of years where the test should be acceptable to the population. And as I said before, we really need to think about a different, totally different context of testing. Traditionally, we've been testing women who are either affected or have a family history. Here we're talking about testing unaffected women and then testing um, their relatives. And so it's really a, uh, you know, a public health-based model and it's outside the disease context. And the question is, how do you get healthy people to even know about it, A, and B, how do you get them to be tested? They're not coming to the doctor because they have a symptom or because they have family history. 
So we designed a study to look at this, and we looked at two different models. One model was where we recruited individuals uh, through the medical system, either through their doctor, a nurse, or a research assistant. The other possibility was self-referral through posters, brochures, word of mouth, and increasingly, of course, social media. We enrolled over 1,700 individuals, about 1,000 in the recruiter enrolled arm, and uh, close to 750 that were self-referred. And what we did here is that we did away with the traditional pretest genetic counseling. And the participants only received written information about the test before they were tested. They were tested for the three common mutations, and then the results were given in three different ways. Non-carriers who did not have family history just got a letter by mail saying, you're at population risk, do whatever everybody else is being offered, which in Israel is mammography from age 50. Non-carriers that had a significant family history were called in to receive genetic counseling. We received genetic counseling and were given a letter, and of course carriers were also called back to receive genetic counseling as well as written advice. And I'm not going to go, uh, for, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the, the whole study. It's been published in two papers. The references uh, will come up immediately. But I want to say a couple of minute words about the conclusions. We found that screening is feasible. Uptake was about 67%, so about 23%, sorry, about two-thirds of women whom we approached uh, were interested in being tested. We had very high compliance with the post-test genetic counseling. There was a lot of concern that if people didn't get in-person explanation before testing, they wouldn't take it seriously afterwards. But all of the carriers came back for counseling, as did 90, almost 90% of the women who were not carriers but had significant <coughs> family history. We found that without previous counseling, with receiving only written information, there was high satisfaction. There was a moderate, no, moderate knowledge of BRCA and, um, and a sense of control. There was minimal psychological harm. Actually, an interesting concept that came out of the study, we did this with a medical sociologist, Professor uh, Aviad Raz from Ben Gurion University, were that actually people tested, ex expressed a preference for stepwise knowledge. They said, don't give us all this tons of information before we get tested. Once we have the results, then we, we want to hear the results and understand them in the context of our, of our own situation. Carriers emphasize the importance of continued support, and indeed in our hospital, and in other hospitals in Israel, there are specialized clinics for following carriers. Um, we found that both an open access sort of self-referral and a medical model uh, worked well. And they were important because we got different types of, of people from them. Self-referrals were from younger people with more family history, whereas recruiter enrollment or a medical uh, model um, got us older women. Uh, still, participants were older than we would like. If we really want to prevent cancer in carriers, we should be getting them around their age 30, their early 30s. Uh, the mean age here was around 50, so by then many carriers are already affected. Um, but we found that screening in general overcomes significant barriers. The biological barrier of 50% of carriers not having family history, um, there are issues of familial communication, <laughs> families of mutations, relatives don't necessarily tell each other about this, and there could be also a lot of referral and bureaucratic barriers that are overcome if you just have a, a program where everybody can just come and get tested. Um, just one last word. Last uh, word is about the uh, cost effectiveness of population screening. So we're, this is a study we're doing now in Israel, so I don't have results of it yet. But I can tell you that in the UK, this has already been done. It's been published in the JNCI um, in the beginning of 2015. And they found that in Ashkenazi Jews, uh, testing for the common mutations is not only cost-effective, it's even cost-saving. And this is even before talking about, you know, saving lives and, uh, and saving the, 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 the trials and tribulations of ovarian cancer. Um, so again, going back to my list, I think we were able to check off um, all the items, and what it tells me is that we should really be uh, looking at population screening for founder mutations um, in our population. I want to emphasize that this is just a paradigm for other populations. Um, just to show you here, this is uh, the frequency of the 5382 insert C mutation in BRCA1, which is found in Ashkenazi Jews in all of Europe. You can see that in Russia, it represents almost 70% of all BRCA1 mutations. In Central, uh, Central Europe, it's about 50%. As you go west, it decreases. But, for example, the Mexican population also has a founder mutation. It's a multi-exon deletion in BRCA1, and other, other, kind of other populations have founder mutations. So it's not a unique situation uh, to Ashkenazi Jews. And in addition, you know, we're now at the stage where sequencing the, the gene, looking at it from top to bottom, 
is extremely inexpensive. And so I think that what we've observed in the Ashkenazi population is actually applicable to any population. And I'm going to finish with a plea, because you're going to hear a lot of talks about how genetics and tumor genetics are being used to treat cancer. And I would urge us as a field to think about the step earlier, right? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we should be really using this information for prevention. I think there's a lot of lip service given to precision medicine, and it's all preci precision medicine and treatment, but I think where it would be the most useful is using precision medicine for prevention, and I think this is what BRSA testing in a general population can represent. So I want to thank all the many collaborators uh, in Israel and abroad and the agencies that fund our, our research. Thank you.